this is the uh, one meeting of the year uh, that the superintendent starts the meeting uh, because our first item of business is the election of the chair of the Board of Education um, for the, the new year. So uh, given that agenda item, I would like to open uh, to nominations for uh, board chair. I'd like to make a nomination for okay. Donna Bealey for chair of the Board of Education. Okay. Second. Nominations are still open. Are there any other nominations? Seeing none, nominations are closed, and I will call for a vote. All Agreed. those in favor? Is there a com no comment section? Not generally. Okay. <laughs> um, no. Okay. <laughs> Would you want to make a comment, Mr. Chiazzo? If it's not protocol, then that's fine. Um, I, can, I will make an exception this evening. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> so I have a second. Are there comments? Anyone? <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> Um, there's an old adage that says you don't change horses in the middle of a race. So uh, I do have some concerns regarding the timing of this action. Uh, I've heard from various reasons from many of you as to why you feel this action is appropriate. Some of the reasons I heard are no chairperson has ever served longer than two years, or it's just time for a change, or someone else needs to take a turn at the position. None of these or any other reasons I've heard have called into question the dedication, the devotion, or the effectiveness of the current chair. I'd like to point out some irrefutable facts. The qualities of an effective leader don't have an expiration date, and they aren't dictated by the turn of a calendar. Likewise, history has proven time and again that those traits don't suddenly appear because that person happens to sit where a person happens to sit, be it on a throne, or in an Oval Office, or in a chairperson's seat. I truly believe this board was and could continue to be a very highly functioning board. I will, however, qualify those remarks with a stipulation that we all remember to keep the needs of our students, our community, and the school district above our own individual needs. So for those reasons, I will support Donna as the chairperson moving forward. Thank you for allowing me to comment. Other comments? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor? Seven. You, you may vote. <laughs> yes, you may vote. And you will. Seven and one. Uh, Mrs. Bealey is the new chair of the Scarborough Board, and I'm going to give her the gavel so that she has full control and remind her that it's evening, not morning. <laughs> Thank you so much, and good evening, everyone. At this point in time, um, the next item is election of the vice chair. Uh, do we have any nominations? Jane? I will nominate Kelly Murphy as vice chair. Second. Second. Very good. Any comments to be made? Okay, all in favor? Mrs. Murphy becoming vice chair of the school board. Seven plus one. Thank you. Congratulations, Mrs. Murphy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next item on the agenda is presentation of committee assignments. And um, I've taken the liberty in the event that I was elected chair this evening to, um, you know, take into consideration uh, the significant work of the uh, finance committee and uh, so I, I really feel that it's important for the finance to be able to carry on very quickly with the town council, being that there's a December 2nd meeting with the two, the council and the uh, school board. Tentative. Tentative date, December 2nd. And so that comes before our next board meeting. Um, so I would like to uh, suggest that uh, we consider for the chair, Mr. Chiazzo, um, to join him, Mrs. Massengill, 
and to join him, Mrs. Leng. And finally, that I will sit as the alternate. We have had alternates in numerous positions before on the town on the school committee, and I think it's a good idea to have that additional voice. Uh, as well as an opportunity to, I won't be able to vote at those meetings, but I will be able to, um, you know, have some comments and engage in the conversation suggestions. Uh, unless there's somebody absent, if somebody's absent, I believe I will have the opportunity to vote at that point. So we would always be able to, you know, uh, hold the meeting and be successful at the end of the evening with a decision. So I would need to have uh, anyone who wishes to speak about that or a motion? Do I have a motion? Not looking for action. No motion on that. Okay. It's your appointment. Very good. So those are the appointments for the Finance Committee. For the remainder of the committees and the liaison positions, I would suggest that you inform me of what your wishes are. I can send you an email tomorrow and you can let me know what you know committees or liaison positions you wish to you wish to partake in. In the meantime, those committees should continue to meet as is as are. So please do so during the next two weeks and then on December fourth we will announce those final decisions. Okay, minutes of November 6th. Move approval is printed. Second. Discussion? Looks good. Okay. All those in favor? Seven plus one. Thank you. Motion to approve high school winter coaching appointments. Do I have a motion? Move approval as presented. Second. Discussion? Mrs. Massenfield? Are there other appointments for winter co curricular? Mr. Legage? Yes. Uh, how many more are we talking about? Uh, between two and five. Okay. Are any of them going to be booster funded or are they all? Yes. Do you have any idea? No. Okay. Do you know when you're expecting to fill the appointments? Hopefully by the next board meeting. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Move approval. <laughs> okay. Oh, yes. yes. Please vote. <laughs> Seven plus one. Very good. Thank you. We will now enter our workshop session. Five point one, student presentation. Yeah. Superintendent. Um, yes, we're we're very uh, we're very pleased uh, this evening. Uh, we have a fifth grader, Lillian Finley who is here, she would like to um, address the board and tell you about a project that she is working on and that she has been working on. And it's particularly, um, it's, a, it's a particularly good meeting for Lillian to present because all of the school principals are here as well in attendance. No pressure. So um, <laughs> let me introduce to you Lillian Finley. Come on up there. Make sure you're all set. Yeah. Off here, so hold on. <laughs> okay, can you read that from there? Yeah. Do you want to? Are you comfortable? Yeah. Making you a little nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Give her some space, George. <laughs> Hi, Lillian. Hi, my name is Lillian Finley. I'm a fifth grader in Mrs. Young's class at Wentworth School. I will be having a Beanie Baby drive starting December 1st through the 12th. All the Beanie Babies I get will be going to Partners for World Health. Partners for World Health is a nonprofit organization that collects discarded medical supplies throughout the state. 
These medical supplies are made less fortunate throughout the world. By doing this, it keeps the environment cleaner and safer. Elizabeth McCullen, founder slash president of Partners World Health, is here to answer any further questions. I started volunteering there in the fall of 2013 with my family. I saw the Beanie Babies there and wondered what they were for. Elizabeth explained to me that they give them to orphans they meet on their medical missions in Africa and Asia. I asked if they needed any more, and the answer was yes. That is when I thought about the Beanie Baby Drive. The first drive was in January of last year at the Old Wentworth. I collected for two weeks and got 388 Beanie Babies, and a few more were added from my mom's work, the surgery center. I thought about making the Beanie Baby, Beanie Baby Drive bigger this year by doing it school district wide. I talked with Ms. Dexter and she passed it on to Dr. Entwistle. I talked with Dr. Entwistle this summer and the dates were set. A collection box will be at, at each school's main office for two weeks and my flyer will be sent by email. If you have any Beanie Babies, please donate. Elizabeth and myself can answer any further questions. Thank you. Lillian, would you like to um, invite uh, Ms. McMullen to come up and be up there with you? Sure. Is she here? She is here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> great job in the first Beanie Baby Drive to help support the uh, Partners for World Health. We are the organization that uh, I founded back in 2009, we're 501c3. We collect all the discarded medical supplies from hospitals here in Maine, nursing homes and private individuals, as well as uh, some in New Hampshire and, and Massachusetts as well. And we also run, and we ship container loads of these medical supplies. We also run medical missions throughout Africa and Asia and take doctors and nurses uh, and Beanie Babies to give away to all the children that we see on our medical missions. I also want to comment about um, what she, she's really done a great job also about the Wentworth Elementary School. You may recall that uh, you had a lot of chairs and tables and desks and everything and we took uh, that, moved it out in June to a warehouse and that, that uh, school just moved last week at a huge container load to Bangladesh. And you should be very proud because and I have some handouts here. We're calling it the Mr. Chip School, which is after my brother who died last year in December. And it's the school that's going to be uh, started for early childhood education and grades on kindergarten up to sixth grade. And we are working with a partner in uh, Dhaka City in Bangladesh called Eminence. And they have already found the building of an eight-room building where the school is going to go to. So it's pretty exciting so that your school did not go to waste. Your school is really going to be involved with lots of young kids that currently are sitting on the school. <coughs> not right on and no paper, et cetera. So we're pretty excited about that. And so we're pretty excited about the Beanie Baby Drive, too, because we anticipate that this Beanie Baby Drive is going to bring in more than 500 Beanie Babies. Don't you think? Yes. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, William. I just have a comment. I just want to commend you on, one, getting up there and speaking in front of all of us, mm -hmm. and two, for, for what you're organizing. It's fantastic, and, and I hope we can all help you in finding more teeny babies at our own homes or our neighbors' homes or wherever. So, great job. Thank you. Keep Lillian, what was your inspiration? Um, I thought it would be a great help to the orphans <coughs> in, in Africa and Asia. Well, I think you're right. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Absolutely. When will the boxes come to the schools? I'm the principal at eight corners, so I just want to know when to look forward to getting the box. Um, I think it will be on Tuesday. And what's your time frame again for collecting the beanies? Um, December 1st oh. through the 12th. 
It's on this lovely handout that you made that's sitting <laughs> to the right of you. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Excellent. Good luck. So, um, Lillian, we have a Facebook page for the school board, and we can put this right on there for you. So we can have all our friends on Facebook know about your drive and hopefully collect a lot for you. So good luck. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. And we have 5.2, Improvement Strategy Progress Update. We have some materials to pass out and a um, presentation that we're going to warm up here. Kelly, do I need your... Oh. With, um, this, this is a Prezi, um, and uh, this one page basically captures the entire presentation. Um, this is um, a presentation that I'm sharing with um, each of the key leadership um, members who has responsibility um, for the school or for the department. Um, what you see, or what you will see, is a um, uh, is you'll see a report out from uh, the K-2 schools, Wentworth, Middle and High School, Special Services, Curriculum, Information Technology, Athletics, and uh, the overall district. Um, each of the presentations includes a, a few highlights, and they are just that, highlights, uh, that come from the 24-month improvement plan. Um, and uh, it's safe to say that while uh, the presenters will be speaking about three highlights, you can best be sure that there are many other pieces of success from that 24-month plan. Um, basically, the lion's share of the 24-month plan uh, has been addressed, so these highlights will really be representative of the work that's been done in each of the phases in each of the departments. I think it's important as well, there are budget implications for each slide as, um, that you'll see. These are preliminary, they're not prioritized in any way, uh, they have not been fully vetted. Um, we are very early in the process of developing the Leadership Council budget proposal. If I were to explain what you will see in terms of the budget implications, it's essentially what would constitute a modified student needs budget. Okay. Much work still needs to be done, and there are many opportunities ahead to ask questions um, as we proceed um, with creating the um, Leadership Council budget. If you go back here, you see that the, um, 
the title of this report is really a progress report and budget implications. And it's really to give the board a bird's eye view, um, a, a sense of how things are coming together, and I think uh, a careful listen will give you a sense of the themes that are identified both in terms of improvement, continued work, and budget implications. I've asked each of the presenters to give you the cocktail party version, which means that it is um, going to be about three or four minutes each, um, and we are, otherwise uh, you are in for a very long evening. So um, I think, again, the purpose of this is to, is to come up to 3,000 feet, take a view at what is happening, both in terms of the progress on the 24-month plan, which is extraordinary, um, and uh, uh, the, the budget implications, which really speak to what the work is moving forward. Um, and so with that, I will, uh, invite, uh, I will invite the presenters to stay basically where they are and speak from the table. It would just be easier, and, and I will move uh, through this. So uh, first on the, on the docket is uh, K2, and Kelly Mullen-Martin is going to speak to K2. Um, Kelly Crosby, could you just pull, pull that um, <coughs> and just straighten that thing out so that we can hear both of you when you're speaking? Up. There you Thank go. You. Thank you. There you go. Good evening. I will do my best to do the cocktail party version. <laughs> um, one of our highlights is our new writing curriculum it is going extremely well. Implementation is going very smoothly. We're already seeing great results with our students, and teachers are really positive about it. Um, a related highlight is the second bullet, which is the instructional coach, um, a really critical investment that you made for us, um, which the resources, the expertise, the support for teachers is really critical in helping them to implement this program with fidelity. And we are so grateful. And she just happens to be fantastic, but that's sort of the icing on the cake. Um, finally, readiness and progress assessments. Where we've been doing a lot of work and making investments as a phase to be more consistent in how we look at students coming into our schools and how we monitor their progress while they're with us and when we send them on up uh, to 3-5. It's still a work in progress, but we are making strides in that area and have a lot more data to look at together and, and to see where our needs are in terms of student needs and student growth. Uh, in terms of our needs and some potential budget implications on the horizon, uh, one of the pieces that we're struggling with um, is some needing some behavioral support resources. Um, every year we have kids enter our schools with more and more complex profiles, needs, and behavioral challenges. And each of our K-2 schools is really one challenging student away from tipping the scales of the entire building. And it happens every year. We, and we rely heavily on supplemental subs. Often they're not identified as, as students with special needs and, and have to go through that process. So we're looking to find a better balance um, and a little, build up a little bit more of a buffer so that we can meet student needs, differentiate learning, and be able to square kids away without having to rely on, on substitutes or be scrambling or have office um, secretaries working with students because we don't have anybody else to help. So that's a, that's a piece. Um, another piece that we're, we're struggling with and working on is finding, carving out time for teachers to collaborate, to plan, to be able to look at students together, really share students, become more student-centered, um, be able to group kids flexibly. That all takes time. Um, and currently with the staffing that we have and the professional development time that we have, that's very challenging and very difficult. So, we sort of have that as a long-term goal to be chipping away at, at trying to find more and more opportunities for teachers to do that. And uh, we'd like to see some of that motion forward um, in our budgets as we move along. Finally, um, on the horizon, and, and again, I know we know it will be in pieces, um, a technology upgrade at K2 will be needed. Uh, we have teachers working on laptops that are nearing the end of their lifespan. Um, and we really need to provide more access for students from the minute they walk in our buildings to be able to be career, college and career ready by the time they leave the high school. So that's another piece. That's it. 
So at Wentworth, um, our first highlight of accomplishment is that we've safely and efficiently welcomed over 850 students and staff into their beautiful, safe, new, strong, healthy school. So that's been a real highlight for us, clearly. Organizationally, we've assembled ourselves into learning communities, um, and the, this um, enables us to really make some progress on pro project-based learning and support students um, throughout their entire three years at Wentworth, and we are truly, truly grateful for our new educational home. Um, we're very, very proud um, of the advancement of literacy for all students in grades three through five, similar to what um, Kelly was talking about at the K-2 schools. We've built a foundation by really emphasizing a school-wide focus on literacy and reading skills, and we've implemented that our incredible new writing curriculum at three through five, um, like at K-2, units of study for teaching writing. We've already noted, like they mentioned, an incredible um, impact on not only skills and behaviors, but students' attitudes about writing, that they're excited to write, and um, it's been wonderful to see. We're looking forward to the next step, which is implementing um, our reading, a new reading curriculum. Um, in our new facility, it's also a noto notable accomplishment that we have fully embra embraced the technology and infrastructure that we now have. Um, it's allowed us to move to regular digital, completely paperless communication with our families and stakeholders, which has been um, wonderful and effective. Um, also, we have healthy access to point of learning technology in every classroom. A stroll down the hallway would you would notice you know, boards on, laptops open, hover cams in use, and students fully engaged in their learning. So that's been wonderful and a highlight. Uh, moving forward, we will be advocating for a STEM or technology teacher to take the lead in our STEM labs and really make that return on investment, providing science, technology, engineering, and mathematics learning opportunities for our students. Um, we've recognized a connection between that investment and some potential, potential blended learning resources uh, for science, social studies, and foreign language. Uh, blended learning means that a student learns at least in part online or digitally with adult support. Um, so we think that that conservative investment would really begin to restore the loss of foreign language at the intermediate level. And then finally, as a shared school and town investment, um, we'll be advocating for a school resource officer to focus on the developmental needs of Wentworth students and in order to support our third through fifth graders and add that increased safety and security to our school, our large facility. And at the middle school, I'm very pleased um, that you supported the restoration of world language at the middle school. Um, it has enabled us to create a more authentic and relevant learning opportunity for our students, grades six through eight. It gives our students more time to acquire proficiency, and our eighth grade students um, are able to have choice, Spanish or French, and it is a core class for them. They have world language every day, and it is amazing to see the work that they are doing um, in the classroom. Um, and I'm also hearing that they're speaking with their parents at home, and parents have been quite excited about that, uh, speaking to me about it during conferences. Um, the um, Google Docs implementation has been very positive. It was a little rocky at the start. It was a huge change for uh, students and teachers, but our new um, uh, technology integrator really supported the learning of students and teachers and parents as we um, improve student learning and moving forward with 21st century skills uh, using Google Docs. It provides for collaboration <laughs> and communication between students and between uh, students and teachers and teachers and students. It's been very positive. Um, I'm most excited about the organiza organizational restructure that you supported last year. It has provided time for teachers to really focus in on improved student learning in their content area. Um, it's also provided the opportunity for a core world language. Um, it has also set the middle school up to continue moving forward in providing um, uh, and moving forward with 21st century skills for all of our students. I'm very excited about the beginning of even more change at the middle school. So um, 
further implications for needs for the future. Um, at this point, we're really focusing on continuing to close the achievement gap in both um, reading, writing, and math. Um, we have many students below proficient in those areas. I would like to, uh, right now we have an ed tech who works very hard in the study center. He does a fabulous job. But this person works with more than 60 students, really needs some support. Our, our children need uh, more opportunities and time after school uh, to work with a staff person. So I am proposing a teacher to join the study center and work with students. Um, in order to develop um, core curriculums that include essential standards and common assessments, I propose um, a one-year investment uh, providing release time for one social studies teacher and one science teacher to be pulled out of the classroom and work with staff to um, develop those uh, essential standards and common assessments, work with those teachers in the classroom while their classes are taught by teachers for one year and then they go back into the classroom because I feel confident that work can be done in a year. And um, the last request, we've been working with um, uh, connections where teachers make connections and work with students, but that really, that program is successful, needs, um, is, is growing, and teachers are finding um, that there is m more, that there, this provides more opportunities for students to become college and career ready. But in order to make that happen, we need a guidance counselor to help develop that curriculum. And we also um, have two guidance counselors who are working with 400 students each. It is too much. They cannot work with the students and provide that guidance curriculum that is so important. So I, am ask, well, I will be asking for a guidance counselor for next year. Thank you. David? Uh, I normally don't attend um, cocktail parties, but I'll give it my best shot. <laughs> um, so it means um, that you keep it very brief and, <laughs> and keep it moving. My introduction would be three to four minutes. Um, in our 24 months improvement plan, we, we just wanted to highlight some of what we think has been um, some drastic improvement and some concerted effort on the part of our staff. So to begin, um, we have aligned our math curriculum in Algebra 1, Geometry, and Algebra 2 with the Common Core State Standards. Um, the resources that we have in place support those standards as well, and that's been implemented in all of those classes. Uh, in addition to that, we have a standard writing rubric for our ELA classes, grades 9 through 12, which was as the, the math work in, in involved a lot of work outside of the classroom, outside of the school day, uh, but that is in place as well. And then we've had, had as a, a big part of our focus with the high school is enhanced communication. Uh, if any of you have seen our newsletters, and you've seen the updated uh, school website, along with our power school announcements that we hopefully are, are more timely. Uh, we know stakeholders felt it was really imperative that we did a better job of communicating to all the stakeholders. So those are some of the highlights. Um, I'd like to point out that I think the foundation for a lot of the work that we do has been accomplished and has been done well because uh, we put into place last year as an organization a process for making decisions that was consistent, it was transparent, and it empowered the staff to be a part of some of those decisions that they really should be a part of. Um, it also provided us opportunities for collaboration, and we worked pretty hard to strengthen the leadership within our building as well. So those are key factors for some of the successes in those highlights. Moving forward, um, if you take a look at some of what we need for budget implications, um, there are essential program components tied to all the content areas. Well, I mentioned math and ELA, but the new law tied to officially based diploma requires standards in eight content areas. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to involve a tremendous amount of work. Um, so we have com program components such as staffing and resources uh, that are going to be necessary for us to fulfill those obligations. In addition, uh, technology is a big piece uh, for the high school. As we've chatted with you before in the past, there's technology in place in a one-to-one -one capacity up through the middle school, and when the students get to the high school, uh, there is none. So not only do we want to try to uh, 
um, strengthen the capacity for technology accessibility for our students in terms of one-to-one, -one, but also some of the offerings that we have in terms of our computer programming classes to make sure our students are better prepared for college and career. Uh, in addition, uh, each of the buildings has mentioned this, uh, and it's, it's a huge piece for the high school, too. When Monique spoke several minutes ago, she talked about the new law regarding proficiency-based diploma, and we have NEAS accreditation that's starting next year. Um, and so time is an essential part of what we're going to be asking for. The resource of time is the most precious resource right now the high school needs. Uh, imagine a, a teacher who has a, a rotating schedule of seven classes, five classes in one day, and on that particular rotation has no prep, no study hall, has to prepare for those classes, has to correct all of those assignments, and that's that teacher's day. And that should be the focus for that teacher. And now we're going to ask them to work with proficiency-based diplomas, the NEASC work, and aligning the standards the way we need to. And there's not time embedded within our schedule to accomplish that work. So the resource of time is going to be a key factor for us. And those mandates that come down for national and state standards and the proficiency-based diploma are the pieces that will uh, be, I think, better supported if we have the additional time. <coughs> and that's it. Very good. That was a, a good cocktail version. Thank you. Thank cocktail you. party ver version. Thank you. Good evening, special services. Um, I also am excited about um, some of our highlights, uh, particularly the alignment of instruction uh, in the sense of very deliberate practice in uh, looking at what students' needs are with our new ELA and math curriculums that everyone K-12 has spoken about and looking at how we can access grade level curriculum, the central standards, and then do the specialized uh, instruction to supplement that. We are really working hard to be very deliberate for students to start making grade level expectations. Uh, and that rolls right up to uh, soon to be graduation expectations. Uh, the second area of programming that we are um, continue to focus on is around social and emotional um, development. The staff, special education staff, did a book study last year and they've been implementing um, strategies to help students emotionally and behaviorally regulate themselves so they can access the curriculum that we're teaching them. In addition, um, we have uh, one of our doctoral level school psychologists consulting biweekly to our social life skills program at each phase, and um, that's bringing great results with um, earlier interventions, revamping of uh, the behavior plans, conducting group uh, behavior assessments. So we're uh, quicker to get in there. In the past, we've been using an outside consultant. So having someone in-house, um, the response time is, is quite quick. Um, student engagement in programming planning. Uh, I've always been a very strong ad uh, advocate that our job is to prepare students to stand on their own, to understand who they are, who they are as a learner. And so we now are um, implementing strategies at each phase and each developmental level um, to help them understand what their needs are, what their strengths are, what, how the, their IEP is actually a tool for them, a tool in understanding what their focused learning is on and what accommodations they should be uh, requesting and advocating for themselves in any of their learning environments. Uh, behavior implications for special education that, that we can plan for, because there's many that are unexpected uh, implications, uh, is around the behavioral supports. Uh, you've heard uh, K2 speak about that specifically, but it's also been embedded in each um, phase along the way. We um, have unexpected situations that students come to us with very high level needs that can disrupt the entire learning environment and take three full-time staff members to manage, manage that child so that they're safe and they can try to access learning. Uh, we have one behavioral specialist in the district. When we have a student that is in that kind of need, that requires this person to work full-time with that student for up to a two-week period. So you can imagine if you have three or four situations in the district how that plays out. So we've had significant results of students 
not having to go to out-of-district placements, of reducing the need of one-on-one -on -one instruction when we have skilled behavioral supports that can train staff and develop very customized programming. Uh, so that is a, a need we have that will, in the long run, be a, a benefit for us fiscally. That's it. Very good. <coughs> Uh, it really doesn't matter whether or not I'm heard because you have already <coughs> heard from each of the phase levels and I may well be just repeating some pieces. You've heard a bit about the uh, highlights around the <coughs> comprehensive K-5 literacy piece at the K-2 and the 3-5. I will let you know that our consultants, in addition to the initial training that they did in August, uh, came back. They modeled classroom um, practices for the teachers and assisted in planning. The teachers are also involved in grade level meetings after school, before school, in terms of continuing to plan and reflect on those instructional units. The writing program is very specific. There are specific expectations in terms of what's taught and how it's taught because we know now how to teach writing in a more effective way. Uh, the, another highlight, the value added by the instructional coaches, again with the literacy but also with mathematics and they're also involved across content areas. Uh, the instructional coaches are working with teachers within the classroom and outside the classroom, running after school meetings, running parent evening sessions as well. And another highlight, advancing the student-centered learning. We're looking at our practices, both instructionally, and you'll hear a little bit about that in terms of our professional learning system, but also organizationally and also in terms of curriculum. And like Ms. Marchese uh, mentioned, it's really about students becoming engaged in their learning. We've set standards and expectations for students, and now we want to engage them in that learning, and we want to make that learning authentic and relevant. Uh, so that they will be college and career ready when they leave us. Uh, in terms of budget implications, you've heard time, time and again. Uh, one of the things, uh, having been here a few years, I remember there was a time when we had some early release days, about 14 or so, and we lost those. And we should have lost those because they were not well used. We didn't, weren't, didn't have as uh, fine a focus in terms of continual improvement that we have now. And I'm hearing over and over again at the phase levels, we want to improve our practices. We want to do better. We just need the time to do that. After school is maxed out. Before school is maxed out with meetings. And at certain phase levels, based on reorganization, some time within the day was found. But in order to find time for some groups of teachers, that means those students need to be involved with other teachers. And that's where we don't have the staffing to provide that time during the day. So we'll be bringing forward some um, uh, recommendations for finding some time, but they will have budget implications. Uh, just met today with a group of instructional coaches as well as classroom teachers to take a look at our science curriculum. As you know, I've spoken before, our materials, especially K-8, we're supposed to have a shelf life of about eight years. We're going on 18, 19, in some cases 20 years with those materials. We've gotten great value for the dollar, but it's time to update those resources. Also in terms of resources is teaching staff. There are certain courses we are unable to offer because we don't have the staff that students need if they're going to pursue um, careers either in engineering, computer science, or other STEM-related fields. Uh, we're also involved in taking a look at um, record keeping and reporting technology, software applications where students can track their own progress in terms of meeting their learning goals, knowing their strengths, working on their weaknesses so that when they do graduate, we know that they are proficient in all areas that this board will decide um, on in terms of graduation requirements. Thank you. So, like Mimi said, I'm probably repeating now a lot of what you've already heard. Uh, we've had a pretty busy year in information technology. Launching Wentworth was really the focus for us this year. Um, when Wentworth went live, they went live with one-to-one -one laptops for all the students. So that was roughly 850 devices there. Um, we um, overhauled all of the devices for the staff. We overhauled the entire infrastructure. We um, brought in interactive EO boards and doc cams for every single classroom. Then we provided training for all of that for the staff, training for the students, 
um, they had not had this type of technology in the past, so it actually was challenging for everybody to try to get this done within the first couple of months of school. And they handled it very well, considering <laughs> everything else that was being thrown at them. Um, and then we also did some training slash meetings with the parents to kind of let folks know what was going on and what their kids were going to be um, using the laptops for and if they had any questions about security or anything else. Um, we also, at, at the same time, it's important, I think, to note that Wentworth had not come up on the new telecom system. They had not come up on the new um, printing, centralized printing system that we had. So they were trying to learn all of that at the same time and we were trying to install that and bring that live. Um, we also, as Barbara mentioned, we have deployed Google district-wide and we also were in the process of deploying Huddle. Google is sort of the um, general uh, doc, store, share, drive for students and staff and you can do quite a bit through collaboration and Google Apps and other things. Um, Huddle is really going to be used by the staff and it is the secure document storage for confidential and restricted um, documents. So we are in the process of trying to help everybody move everything over to Google. We've actually conducted quite a bit of in-depth training for Google to staff and students. Huddle, we, um, within the next week or two, we will have um, brought the entire special services team up on Huddle. And then um, we're really hoping that within a couple of months after that, we'll have brought everybody else up. Um, and the, the reason for that is really it's to, to relieve strain on our internal systems and kind of provide economies of scale for um, technology usage. Uh, we launched a new website, which we were very excited about. That was another huge um, focus for us this year. Um, the new website is actually also on a Google platform, so it kind of helps us because it streamlines everything and um, lets us use Google Apps for a variety of things. There's a new user interface, there's new navigation. We so far have received really positive feedback. And the new site um, mirrors the town site, too, finally. So users aren't having a sort of jolting experience of going from the town site to thinking, well, are we actually still in the town of Scarborough when they go to the school district site? <coughs> um, budget implications, we are looking at one-to-one -one technology access at the high school. We're looking at a variety of different solutions. We kind of discussed those a little bit last year, but just to recap, um, we're looking at potential for one-to-one -one laptops, and we're looking at potential for one-to-one -one Chromebooks, um, maybe with a virtual desktop interface on the back end of it. We have considered um, bring your own device, BYOD. So we're kind of pricing all of that out and taking a look at the pros and cons, and we'll be bringing some kind of proposal forward. Well, it's certainly always a pleasure to talk about athletics and student activities in Scarborough because there's a lot for this town to be proud of related to that. Um, <clears throat> the success this fall alone with students, whether it's um, winning a state championship in athletics or whether it's performing on a stage um, in Oak Hill Players production, we have a lot to be proud of. And certainly those, those students have quickly developed the skills um, needed to be successful in balancing a rigorous schedule. And certainly that learning is, is a critical life skill. Um, <clears throat> and it certainly goes without saying that athletics and activities in our school helps to create um, a town-wide identity, as well as providing opportunities for our students to understand the importance of community services, developing a support network, um, and it is certainly um, clear to everyone that students are most successful when they develop that positive adult relationship with somebody. And athletics and activities provides that tool for students to develop that relationship with an adult. Um, Post-secondarily, certainly, um, students have an opportunity that they might not otherwise have 
um, when they're faced with being able to maybe participate at, in athletics at the college level and open up some doors that way and some opportunities for students that they might not otherwise have had. Um, just this past week, we had three of our students sign national letters of intent, um, and that was a, a real turning moment in their life and, and a great opportunity for us to be proud of those students that um, had that opportunity to go to school and um, certainly um, those activities that they're involved in in college um, also help keep those students connected to college and, um, and maybe not uh, come back home after the first year. Um, so we're, we're proud of uh, the things that everybody has done and as, as you should be. Certainly moving forward, um, athletics has a lot of needs financially. Um, that certainly goes without saying. And one of those is safety related um, with, um, with nearly 900 students involved in athletics during the course of the year. Our athletic trainer is certainly overtaxed with the responsibilities he has in maintaining um, the medical issues that he has to deal with on a regular basis. Um, so we'll be looking to uh, talk with you a little bit about that. Certainly, um, we're going to be looking at some alternative funding in our department, whether that's through some level of development program or um, to take a hard look at activity fees and how we use those, where that's our most stable form of income right now, to offset the um, large uh, uh, shortfall in our budget. So. Um, we're going to be proposing some some different uh, options with funding this year as well. Good. Uh, <clears throat> I'll address the uh, the district level and, and ask um, Joanne to to join in. Uh, I think that if you look at the progress highlights, these are all um, extraordinarily big initiatives uh, that have been worked on uh, during the 24-month improvement plan. Uh, each of the folks who have reported out from their school and or their department have also played an integral role in uh, moving these initiatives along. I think it's also important to know that these initiatives are essential to moving to being a high-performing school district. I'll start with the professional learning system. Um, essentially what we're talking about is building a very comprehensive and a cohesive system that really takes our collegial learning, our professional learning teams, takes our professional evaluation and professional growth model, which is, as you know, the Marzano model that we will be piloting, um, and, uh, and, and connects those two with the other professional resources and supports that we have to improve um, uh, teaching, um, and learning, instruction and learning all across the district. Um, the, speaking of one of those components, uh, which is probably the newest innovation uh, here in Scarborough uh, for a very long time, is the evaluation and, and growth system. <laughs> it is, it, it is a, an extraordinary system, highly sophisticated, attached to significant professional learning resources, and as I've said time and time again, whether or not the state was going to require us to do this or not, it's the time for Scarborough to really move to an evaluation and growth system that is 21st century focused, connected with professional learning, um, and, and truly meaningful regardless of whether you are a brand new teacher, a 10-year teacher, or a 30-year teacher. The third progress highlight, again, um, with a lot of activity, particularly during the 24-month uh, the plan, is the Health Safety Security Advisory Team, really focusing on health, safety, security, and wellness. Um, we have three groups that deal with um, important things, um, particularly important when something on the national news gets our attention and people start asking in the community, well, what are our schools doing to make sure that our schools are safe? Well, we're doing quite a bit. We are looking at emergency planning, response, and training, and that is not something that has been a knee-jerk reaction. It's been very well thought out, it's been very strategic, and it's been sustained over time, and it continues to be, um, to be uh, pushed forward. We are looking at school climate and culture. 
um, critically important to creating a safe, welcoming, and inclusive environment for all students. Um, and third is really um, the focus on uh, health and wellness. And uh, the new piece of uh, the initiative for health and wellness is also attaching a component looking at workplace safety, which is not only the right thing to do with 500 or so employees in, in what can be a dangerous work environment, but it's critically important as we work with our workers' compensation insurer to demonstrate to them that we are taking proactive measures to ensure that our workers are safe, they're being, um, they're being taught safe work, work practices, and that we take workplace safety um, very, um, very seriously. I think the other piece about the um, HSSAT team is that it's another demonstration of the collaboration between the town um, and the schools. And it's a very, a very powerful, very strong group of folks who are very committed um, uh, collaboratively uh, to making those improvements. So what kind of budget implications are there at the district? Um, there's really not big budget implications that, uh, that I'm seeing on, on the horizon for at the district level. Um, the professional evaluation, professional growth resources, uh, we've made a significant commitment to them. We'll probably need to make some more commitment in terms of uh, continuing the professional uh, development piece of that that's, that's required. Um, I also have to say that that system, that model, the professional evaluation, professional growth model has been an extraordinary opportunity for this group of professionals, our leadership council, really coming together and talking about what does quality teaching look like? How do we know when we're seeing quality teaching? What do we do when we don't see quality teaching? And what are the resources that we have to really work with individuals who want to become stronger um, but, but, but need a pathway to um, a higher level of quality in their instruction. It's, a, it's an extraordinary model. Um, and we are learning great things in terms of eye observation. Um, the PLTs are getting much more in-depth in, in terms of being focused on the, pro the PL part, the professional learning part of that. And I think that um, Donna had, had spoken at one of the last meetings saying, you got to understand, this is not a simple thing to pull, put a system like this together that is, that is cohesive and connected. And she's absolutely correct. And over these 24 months, we have been building the components, and, and, and now we are putting those components together into that um, learning system uh, for Scarborough, quite unlike anything that you will see in other districts, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. Joanne, thoughts? Uh, yes. Um, when I looked at the whole uh, system here that we everyone has talked about, I said to myself, um, and I made a comment to George about our investments with the new curriculum has been have made tremendous impacts. And what have what has caused those impacts really have been the support for staff with the ICs going in and helping them after they've gone to a training to learn this new curriculum and then supporting them as they go along. That's what's different. Before we would you we would have investments in curriculum, teachers would go to a workshop, but then when they went back to their classroom there wasn't that ongoing support to making to make sure that those materials were implemented the way they should be. The PLTs that we have are connected now, and they are working towards a common goal, which are 24-month improvement plan. The PLT work, which is Marzano, is now connected to their evaluation and the growth. So we are really taking a focus on how do we connect all of this. We've had an evaluation system in before. It was over here. We had professional development. It was over here. And we had curriculum, and it was over here. I have to say that in the last several years, we have all taken that work, put it together, and teachers now see the importance of being a professional and working towards a common goal that will increase student achievement. And that's what I see in a very short period of time happening more than anything else I've seen since I've been here. And I've been here a long time. 30 years, she told me. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm only 30 her, years old. Her, <laughs> her words were something like, in all my 30 years, I have not seen yeah. the, like, the, the kind of results and connections 
that are being made now, and, th and that's, that's great. We want to maintain that momentum. Again, this is a modified, if you look at just the budget implications, it's a modified student needs-based budget. We're not anticipating that all of those things are going to hit the budget all at once, but it does give you a sense as to the kind of things that we're thinking about. You see the themes that are running through. Time is significant. You can best believe that we'll be coming forward in terms of a proposal um, for adding additional time um, for, uh, for all of the work that needs to be done. Uh, you know, it's interesting, and I shared with the, board, with the, uh, the team the other day that um, while uh, we have not moved at the pace that I would have liked to move and that the rest of the team would like to move. And while we've had to flatten the trajectory in terms of our focus of uh, moving from here to there, um, there's something else that's happening. And that is that in a district that has one of the lowest um, per pupil costs as it relates to um, uh, leaders, um, quite frankly, we are hitting a capacity issue. We're, 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 we're bumping our heads on a, a, a limitation in terms of our capacity. And so it was critically important for us in preparation for this presentation to the board to step back each, each of the school leaders going back to their areas of responsibility, working with their teams, and rethinking, first off, celebrating what they've accomplished, which is great things through the 24-month plan. And then secondly, and very importantly, getting refocused on what are the things that are viable, feasible, and that we have resources and energy and capacity to keep moving. And I think those are the kinds of things that you're seeing reflected in those budget implication items. Um, and so I'm, uh, again, I always say that I'm very proud of this team. I couldn't be pleased, more pleased, any more pleased uh, to be a part of uh, such a dynamic group, a hardworking group. Um, but I do worry about them banging their heads as well. So we need to constantly refocus. We have great ambitions. We, the trajectory is, is adjusted on the basis of the resources that we have, but it's also important that I remind them that they can't take on layers and layers of responsibility um, because everything becomes diffused. So we've become refocused, which is a really good thing. We've become, become sort of laser-like in that focus around those things that we've got moving, and those are the things that we're going to keep moving. Your reactions. Any comments? Questions? <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Well, it's so much to, you know, digest. It's just so many different pieces. Um, clearly, to me, the issue of time keeps coming up. And um, I appreciate the, the situation you're in where we have a lot of mandates that have come down. They come down without money. And it's demanding enormous amounts of time from our staff uh, from our leaders um, to, to give us the direction to provide the, the leadership to your staff and then from our teachers who need to sit and uh, find the time, their own personal time, to do the kind of work. Um, enormous amounts of hours go into that observation, evaluation, professional development plan huge amounts of time have to go into standard planning and uh, professional development for how are we going to meet a standards-based education. What is it? How are we going to create it? Because we don't get a lot of information from the state. I'm not sure if there's many people who know what to do about this. And yet it's a mandate and something we have to do. How do you get it done? You don't have the time. To do the kind of work, it's, it's an all-day kind of a job, <laughs> it's, you know, so, um, and it takes a lot of heads, a lot of brains to come up with that. So, um, you know, I appreciate uh, all the effort you put into it and um, applaud you for your work and for hanging in there with us. Yes, Ms. Ling? Good to see 
Any other comments? Questions? Yes. I just had, I have a question with regards to uh, the organization of, of the K-2 schools and, and the, the leadership that will need to be addressed at the Wentworth School and, and when will that be addressed by? Sometime after the holidays. Okay. I think that's strategic as, we, as we're planning uh, and have that participation of, of the building of the building leaders. It's a good I think it's a really good question, Jackie. And um, and basically the other piece that, um, in fact, Jane and I tried to, to get together two times today, and we got we got bumped out. But um, Jane is the chair of the long term facilities um, uh, committee, and um, there's extraordinary work, really impressive work that has been done. Uh, by Dan Cecil and, and the system that he has designed. It's, it's, it's truly amazing. Um, I think that it's critically important that, um, and Jane and I are, are working this strategy to ensure that the board is updated and as well my team is updated about what is what does the system look like. It's, it's really just those of us who have been part of that team who have had the um, advantage and opportunity to really see the sophistication of what he has done. Go, you know, there may be seven possible scenarios that could address some of the, for example, I think the thing that comes to mind first is the overcrowding at the middle school. And there may be seven possible scenarios. Well, each of those have an upside, and you can be best uh, believe that each of those also have a downside. And so I think that um, it, it's critically important that we understand what I, if, if we're going to be moving towards um, uh, making adjustments, for example, at where you asked, the K-2 schools. This, we know the K-2 schools are lovely, wonderful, idyllic, neighborhood-like. It's, you know, even cute. We could call them cute. <laughs> but we also know, and, and, and they're fabulous places to be, and I, I, I love visiting um, and spending time there, as we all do. But the fact of the matter is they have, you know, they have a limited life on their systems. They're going to require a lot of investments. They are the biggest uh, energy hogs that we have, <laughs> and and so the so all of those things it's are not cute. <laughs> uh, energy, being an energy hog is not cute, not especially at case here. So so all of those things are critically important um, and will impact whatever direction that we might go. And and certainly, um, I think we all need to get our heads around that uh, uh, before we before we jump to any conclusions about, you know, what other things are going to be happening. You might like to know that uh, about 20 years ago when we were discussing expanding the K-2 schools, that I wanted to build a K-5 school. You should have done it. Well, <laughs> everybody wanted the neighborhood schools, and I kept saying, there are schools and neighborhoods, they are not neighborhood schools. That's exactly right. And, and that was 20 years ago. That was before we ever built the, the middle school. But 
could not get that, couldn't even get it by the board. There were only five members of the board at the time. So uh, I've, I've been looking at this for years and years and wondering how long it could sustain itself. We don't even have enough parking places, for heaven's sakes. I went over to read at Pleasant Hill the other day, and, and I was had to squeeze in almost where you're not supposed to park, you know, and I'm sure that parents and volunteers are having the same problem uh, when they when they go to our primary school. So uh, I'll be anxious to see uh, what transpires because that's going to have to be addressed. Well, and, and, and it was good foresight on the part of the board to get this study done because now we have now we have all of the information that we need to run any scenario that anybody would like to run, and with a uh, with a uh, return on investment uh, calculation that's that's available as well for every single one. Pretty nifty. Okay. A quick question. Good you. job. Um, I, you did a wonderful job with this, I think. For snapshot, I'll be anxious to see the big picture. Uh, the technology. Every year, there's a new, there's one of the schools is sort of up for the technology overhaul. Where are we going into this next year? Who's, who's up? Well, we're hoping one more time. But in the cycle, very quickly, my friends to the left of me, K K2, will say that they, it's their turn. It's, it's it supposed to. Be, it's supposed to be. <laughs> it's supposed to be their turn. We're at energy if, if we were to follow the cycle, <laughs> <laughs> the energy hawks that are off. Okay. Yeah. That's what I was okay. We'd like to do it with low batteries. <laughs> low batteries. <laughs> <laughs> we charge them. <laughs> Any other reactions, questions? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to 5.3, which is the sharing of learning materials. The school board attended two days at the FMMA Fall Conference in Agatha, where um, school boards from around the state are able to attend workshops and special sessions uh, in which they can learn new things about how things get done on school boards and school districts. So um, we attended those days and uh, have a little reporting to do. Does anyone want to wish to start with some comments about anything in particular you attended? Any thoughts you have? Any questions in mind, Ms. Murphy? Um, I Really, and Jackie, if you could bring this back to the state board, I really liked the opportunity to meet with the region, you know, by county. Is that they did it right with by county? I think it should be longer. Longer. Um, agree. we, we agreed, agreed on that. Yeah. <laughs> There's, um, I think we only had a half an hour or 25 minutes or something, but um, it was. I, I feel like we have a lot we could talk about with that group, and maybe even meet more than just the once a year, but. We had a question about how um, the online testing, mandated testing, is going to happen in the high school, and sort of like, you know, throwing it out there. How are you all going to handle this? And everyone looked at us like we were nuts. And so we all stopped for a second and said, wait, is Scarborough the only one who doesn't have one-to-one -one in the high school? We were the only ones who don't have one-to-one -one in the high school. It was all the Cumberland, it was all the Cumberland County. All the Cumberland County. County. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All Cumberland County. And then we started to just kind of think about who surrounds us in York County, and they have them too. So it's not a crazy request. <laughs> it was, I mean, like, took my breath away when we're looking around and nobody even knew what we were talking about. Like, it wasn't even a concern on their radar at all. Mm -hmm. So it would be great to have more opportunities to talk to board members in the region, um, okay. just more meetings, because I think there's that kind of stuff that I had an idea that we were the lone wolves in the 19th century, but I didn't know for sure until that meeting. So, Well, I can tell you that we have there. tried in the past to have regional meetings that have been very poorly attended over the years, 
uh, you know, I've been to, to be five people, mm. eight people, you know, and and the others have tried. You, you know, you have something like the Sebago Alliance becomes well attended because there's a focus there. And and we had fairly good attendance when we had uh, the uh, what do I want to say the candidates come to the forum mm -hmm. in Gorham. We had fairly good attendance there. But uh, as you know, I was the only person from Scarborough who was able to attend that evening. And uh, it's very difficult to add meetings uh, on a regional level unless you have a serious focus. So I, I will bring that up, however. And, uh, but I do believe that, that a full session at, at next year's conference is warranted, okay. at least for Cumberland County. Or if, there's another, or if there's another meeting where there are a lot of those people already there, yeah. I, and I don't know if there's another meeting other than the MSMA. Well, I was just thinking that if, it, if that is going to be in October of the year, then the six months back, and you know, so there's another opportunity to get together. But I don't know if it could be something like figure out what night everybody else has their board meetings, and maybe there's some that are the same night, and kind of piggyback on one of those nights that everyone already has booked for a meeting. So, anyway. Yes. Well, at the last meeting, as you know, I passed out the the, the uh, material that I received on how to present a budget so that it's uh, more easily received. This one is, uh, as some of you may have seen this, this is from the school law advisory from Drummond Woodsome in, in 211, but it's on one side, it's 10 ways that the superintendent and school boards can undermine each other. And on the flip side, is 10 ways a superintendent might unknowingly undermine a board. So uh, I just thought it was Are interesting. Are going to some of these? <laughs> Pardon me? <laughs> so, Are we but I just, uh, we going to practice them? I, we've been most fortunate here, truly. And I've said for a couple of years now that this has to be the best board I've I've worked with. It truly is. And and uh, but I just thought this was interesting because one says by allowing board members to criticize the superintendent in public, thereby creating the impression that the superintendent lacks the confidence of the board. Uh, that doesn't happen. You know, and the superintendent has never uh, not clearly communicated constraints, trade offs, and alternatives to critical issues which come before the board. I mean, so it, I'm giving this to you so you understand what can happen and how fortunate we are that we work so well together and have such good leadership. Jackie, that's also an appendix in the handout that we get the drum and lava. The one that was from that, honey. Anyone else? Yes. Um, I was there not very long, but I attended two sections that thought was very interesting. Um, even though I'm not on the negotiation committee, I, I, I thought it was, it was very interesting to hear about what's the techniques or what's the new um, negotiation mm -hmm. front and uh, mm -hmm. I think of course those kind of skills and the can be applied many places. I think what's really it was very interesting, I think a new concept I heard uh, at this meeting is uh, instead of thinking about negotiation as a fight and uh, consider it as a dance. So the <laughs> topic was negotiation <laughs> as dance. So instead of, you know, we talk about positioning, you know, you against me and how do we do, you know, think about what size or concessions or um, if I could put, you know, even, you know, winning or something. So think about how we cooperate and, you know, do this thing uh, 
aesthetic way. So um, I also talked about that, you know, do it using like an interest based uh, negotiation. So we, instead of sitting against each other and sit on the same side and really see how we look at together uh, all both of us interests and approach for results that work for both of us. I think, you know, that was very, you know, um, educational for me. I thought um, sometimes it really, from myself reflecting from it, and sometimes I feel like, yeah, so when I see somebody I'm not very familiar with, I negotiate something, I like to naturally sit across from them. Actually, I think it's probably better to sit next to them, you know, just to be able to mm -hmm. uh, little, um, have a different um, kind of starting point, you know, how we're going to relationship you to build on. Now also they talk about the BASNA, which is the best uh, alternative. You know, that was the first time I heard it. I know this is probably not how you know it already. Best alternative uh, at best <laughs> to what are the letters? A negotiated agreement. To BAT to Best alternative, Best alternative to, to a negotiated agreement. Um, Agreed. To, to a negotiated agreement, yeah. Agreed? Okay. So I, I forgot that for example, but how mm -hmm. you shift it mm -hmm. by, you mm -hmm. know, just to do a little bit, you know, the communication, or even put a different position here of yourself. So you kind of change, you know, of the outlook of the, of the negotiation. So that was mm -hmm. something I would like to think about as a dance movie. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I think it will work for everybody better. So. Mm -hmm. I was at that same session that Jane attended, and um, for me, it was a little different take on it. I do sit on the negotiation committee, but I also have been to some other seminars on the interest-based bargaining, and we discussed um, that with the SEA president and their group, and that was not necessarily something that was of interest you know, doing it that way. I mean, we still discuss all those things. It was more of a role-playing situation, that seminar. We sat, we had a counterpart, and we kind of traded seats without actually getting up out of our seat. We changed our position, so we were working <coughs> as the person who was bargaining, and we were, I was playing the board, and the other person was, you know, trying to have a conversation. How could we work this out? How could we resolve the situation? And it ultimately, in my opinion, came down to compromise. Mm -hmm. It really, that was, that was what I found in my group when we changed out positions, so to speak, when we moved through that. So it was interesting to just get that take on playing the other person. Well, yeah, how are you going to... The word he emphasized is empathy. The reason we do mm -hmm. the role play so you see the how the other person felt. From the both sides of it. And mm -hmm. from the negotiation, you know, the kind of the arbitrator in the middleman side. So we actually play all three positions to kind of help you understand, you know, having empathy basically, you know. That's, I know it comes, when we do the, probably everybody will come to different conclusions, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I think the, after the role play, I actually feel like, yeah, you know what, I know what the other people, why did they demand, what they're demanding, you know, kind of understand it better, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Anyone else? I just want a quick um, comment. I went to a couple communication <coughs> seminars, which were great. Um, I won't bore you all with details. But the keynote speaker on the first day, Ken K was his name, he um, did a good job. But one of the things that he brought up was a quote from an Apple executive. And it said, if someone needs to be managed, they're no longer employable. And so I sort of thought about that for a while. And he put up two different students, one being student <coughs> Max knows math, science, reading, social studies. Student B, self-directed, critical thinker, um, well, creative well, problem, problem solver, problem. Solver, all these other criteria. And it became very clear, like, which student would you, do you want your, your students to be? And obviously we all chose student B. But that's what he was what that Apple executive was saying. Student A was just, 
you know, he could use math and science, and, but he always had to come back and say, okay, now what should I do, now what should I do? Whereas in today's education, we're hoping to create student B. And those people are self-directed and can make decisions on their own and move the company forward. So, so here's a nice takeaway. Did you attend his session that was about? Okay. No. Did anybody attend that session other than me? There's oh, student there C. Oh, oh, C. C is what we want. Oh, oh. C. He said. Did you, didn't you catch his little teaser? Oh, yes. the no. <laughs> If you come, you'll find out more. Well, um, there's more. <laughs> student C. So. Yeah, I've tried that line of work. <laughs> <laughs> there are two things that, that I learned that to bring to you from a couple of other sessions. One is that if we use hiring committees when we hire administrators and or superintendents, we should probably have a policy on how to form a hiring committee and what their duties are. And I don't think we have one of those. The second, the second thing is, it, it, in a similar vein but a different seminar was emphasizing that the only person that we hire is a superintendent. That if there is a problem with a teacher or a problem with a janitor or a cafeteria worker, and a parent calls, or, or the person themselves calls, or one of their colleagues calls, you say, I don't hire you. I employ you, but I don't hire you. Only the superintendent can hire or fire. And the superintendent, even, if, and that's why they should have a <coughs> committee, by the way, a policy on hiring committees, because let us say that the committee selects a principal candidate and the superintendent interviews and the superintendent does not wish to hire that candidate even though the committee has recommended that person mm -hmm. only the superintendent can hire so we have to emphasize that uh, always and and make certain that we don't get involved at any level in the hiring process unless we are hiring the superintendent or are asked to serve on, on a committee. So we do have a policy. We do. GCFD-R1. Okay. I'll look that up. I didn't look it up. Thank you. It was updated in 2012. Anyone else? Well, let me just take a minute and I'll just comment, make my comment um, quickly. Um, one of the uh, workshops that I attended was put on by a group called the Main Cohort for Customized Learning, which is you know, a group of people um, with Mary Jane McCallan who have come together with uh, some people from Marzano. And uh, they are now, my guess, employed by 26 school districts in order to develop how do you achieve proficiency-based education, what would a report card look like? So um, I've gotten their materials. I'm going to pass them on to you, um, Monique, I think. Thank you so much. Maybe you've already have some of this stuff from them. Um, but, you know, they gave an example of one of the high schools in the state and how they've determined how they're going to do their report card, um, reflecting as proficiency-based as well as Carnegie units. So it might be of interest to the two of you to look at since it always helps to have another resource. Absolutely. We'll certainly so take a look. Thank you. I'll just hand, hand that down to you. Okay. Anyone else have any comments, questions? I just have one thing. I know that MSMA has said that if, if you want copies of any of the uh, seminars that went on or need an additional something or other resource maybe that they had offered that you didn't write down or wasn't on their handout, that they will provide that for you. I think all you have to do is call them. Mm -hmm. so. From all the clinics, they have extra handouts? Yeah, because I, we left our handout 
on the, oh, for, yeah. Yeah, on the student rep thing. I went to them and I said, I, my understanding was that you wanted these so that if somebody contacted you, you had that paperwork. Well, I went to a lot of the school law things I've tend to see the tracks that I follow and they have um, kind of interesting, maybe just to me because we're nerdy, I don't know, but little um, snippets of case law through the year. So if people are interested in that, apparently we can, I was going to offer to make copies of mine, but if we can just get clean copies without my, my prefer. I find that to be interesting every year. It's just in the last calendar year what's come up and it's all different levels. It's not just Maine, it's, you know, mm -hmm. First Circuit and um, federal, you know, Supreme Court cases. So. Is anybody signing up for the Maine law, uh, I mean the Maine negotiations? Seminar December. Does anyone wish to attend that? I am considering attending that, Jackie. Well, I was going to go if nobody was going, but somebody yep. should attend. I think so too. So we, we will have a candidate. Like if you could just let Kelly know. Um, okay. To whoever would like to go from the board. Okay. All right, and um, right before we finish up, I just want to congratulate Mrs. Massengill and Mrs. Murphy on their re-election to the board. What's nice this time around is that we're all the same. You know, we can just continue on with the work we've been doing. Um, I want to thank you all for the time and the effort, the enormous amounts of time that not only you as school leaders put in, but also all the board members. Um, so, you know, we work really hard and it's, it's really great to work along with you, so I appreciate that. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So move. Okay. <laughs> All in favor? Very good. 11 plus 1? Nope. 11 did, did plus you 1. 7 like, plus 1. Did you teach us like the uh, candy from Kiwanis? Yes. Thank you very much. We love candy. <laughs> <laughs> Crosby should be going, no, right? so I knew her teachers. Oh. <laughs>